Hey, very warm welcome to our audience and thank you for joining this latest Science AAAS webinar, Deciphering the Role of RNA Binding Proteins in Neurodevelopment and Disease. I'm Sean Sanders, Director and Senior Editor for Custom Publishing at Science. Investigating RNA binding proteins or RBPs and their effect on translation has become increasingly important for understanding neurodevelopment and neurodegenerative diseases. The post-transcriptional regulation of RNA via RBPs can have a profound impact on when, where, and how messenger RNA translation occurs within cells, including neurons. However, the mechanistic role that RBPs play in disease progression has not been fully defined. Recently developed high-throughput sequencing techniques have enabled mapping of in vivo protein RNA interactions on a genome-wide scale down to single nucleotide resolution. Studies using an integrative analysis of splicing regulatory networks have led to the identification of hundreds of alternative exons that are controlled by specific neuronal RBPs. Additional work has shed light on how RBPs regulate protein translation and localization at individual neuronal synapses. Continued research into how localized protein synthesis contributes to morphological and functional changes in neurons will provide a better understanding of learning, memory, and neurodegenerative disease mechanisms. I'm joined today by two wonderful speakers who are going to discuss ways to analyze neuron-specific RBPs and RNA transcripts and examine the, the effects of their well-regulated translation at synapses. These speakers are Dr. Michael Kiebler from Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich in Germany and Dr. Charlin Zhang from Columbia University in New York. Finally, thank you to Cell Signaling Technology for sponsoring today's webinar. Now I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michael Keebler. Dr. Keebler is a full professor and head of Depart the Department of Anatomy II and Cell Biology at Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich. The goal of his lab is to understand the molecular basis of synaptic plasticity, including how individual synapses are altered during their lifetime and how this contributes to our ability to learn and remember. A particular focus is the role of RNA binding proteins in these processes and how they might enable a novel molecular mechanism underlying not only learning and memory, but also adult neurogenesis and reprogramming of neurons. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Keebler. Thank you, Sean, for this very kind introduction and the uh, opportunity to talk. I would like uh, today to convince you um, that RNA binding proteins are important uh, regulators, not just of uh, uh, transcription and translation, as you will see, but particular processes that occur in dendrites at synapses. And if they're dysfunctional, uh, that they affect and cause certain diseases. We all know, if you see on this slide, um, you have in blue um, a relatively small cell called a lymphocyte. And on the right side, you see a typical beautiful a hippocampal neuron with um, a cell body and then long extensions, um, in this case here dendrites. And at the tip um, you see uh, that they have lots of synapses. So one cell can have up to uh, 10,000 synapses. And I, in my talk I would like to convince you uh, that it's not just the regulatory unit of one neuron, but that uh, synapses can be individually regulated. We all know about the central dogma in cell biology that goes from DNA to RNA to protein. So it's clear that if you see here transcription that this would occur in the nucleus either of the lymphocyte um, or the neuron. Um, and then obviously uh, the next level, the translation would occur in the cytoplasm. However, on the right side, you see that there's a particular need if you have these um, extra compartments like dendrites and synapses that you may regulate uh, things near the synapse. So here I would like to use a small cartoon and then take you through the processes of an RNA and uh, the relationship uh, with an RNA binding protein. So obviously the first contact occurs here uh, in the nucleus. Um, then uh, those complexes can be exported to nuclear pores uh, 
they uh, come to the cytoplasm and here, uh, for example, certain RBPs dissociate. The RNA is now free and can now be seen by a ribosome and can be translated. However, a particular new process, and I uh, develop on this in the next slide, is uh, certain other RPPs, cytoplasmic RPPs, can join, followed by a molecular motor, in this case, for example, a kinesin or a dynein. Then those RNA molecules are transported uh, to synapses, uh, then through uh, uh, modifications that occur here at the synapse, indicated by synaptic activity, there's post-translational modifications to the RBPs. The RBPs are released, the RNA is free, and now ribosomes that uh, actually exist at the synapse can uh, translate uh, proteins locally uh, at synapses. So in this respect, um, here are um, a cartoon slides that we published recently in physiological reviews, showing the primary evidence on one case that ribosomes and RNA can occur in either outgrowing axons or mature axons. This is largely work by Christine Holt and many other laboratories. And uh, on the top you see uh, that RNAs and also um, ribosomes in the translation machinery can occur uh, at synapses, in this case the postsynaptic site, the dendritic spine. This is work, groundbreaking work by Oz Stewart. So if you now take it, uh, this was uh, a long time ago, uh, a video that I did with an MD student, Martin Kerman, in the laboratory. We took one RNA binding protein, a famous one, a mammalian homolog of the Staufen protein. It's a double-stranded RNA binding protein. And first of all, you see in the cell body uh, that there's large complexes. They're not in the nucleus. They're either on top of the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. Then you see smaller particles that are in dendrites and they show some oscillatory movement. And now look carefully on the left side. I depicted it with a white arrow. You see hopefully a dim but very uh, quite well uh, seen uh, particle. Uh, and this particle moves in a stop and go manner um, along the dendrite uh, towards synapses. So this indicated that actually RNA binding proteins form these RNA granules and that they are mobile units. So we took on 20 years later um, a fellow um, student, uh, Karl Bauer, and uh, it's a pleasure that Karl is actually listening and attending the seminar. Karl did a revolutionary experiment, now taking the RNA. So for the first time, you see a directly labeled RNA. In this case, Carl took advantage of a fantastic, marvelous technique called the MS2 system from uh, Rob Singer and uh, Edouard Bertrand. They're both depicted here in a picture. And if I now play uh, this uh, movie, you will see one particular uh, particle that goes now to the left side. So now it turns. It goes into the same dendrite uh, to the right side. Again, it turns. And it seems to be that it's not depicted to one of the synapses, but it scans and is running into the dendrite. And we call this one, as an analogy, the running sushi model, uh, simply because the RNA seems to be looking for synapses. So in this case, um, simply because it's one of the uh, greatest movies of all time, um, and uh, you can now see this is not just one particle, uh, moving, but look here, particularly the fainter ones, how many particles that you see that show long distance movement, and very importantly, uh, those RNA granules move in two directions, meaning towards the synapses, and uh, they can also uh, um, uh, kind of move in a retrograde uh, fashion towards the uh, cell body. So it's a very dynamic process. So to top it, Carl uh, was now able to show and we combined uh, the MS2 system in green on top uh, with uh, fluorescently tagging um, Staufen protein and then asked the question, and this is seen now in this movie, um, are these RNAs moving together with the RBP? And this would be a classical sushi. So on one side you have the fish and you have the rice. You can now pick your view, but eventually you see 
uh, that uh, they move in the same particle uh, together and are being transported, showing that this is a uh, unit consisting of an RNA binding protein and an RNA. So the next question is, if you think about the sushi, is there a bus stop? So a bus stop would now be shown uh, here in pinkish, and this would be a synapse. We asked, and particularly uh, Carl asked the question, so if we see the running sushi, would they ignore the bus stops, or would we see a certain uh, behavior that the bus stops at synapses, meaning at the synapse? And this is beautiful. You see two different uh, sushi particles, and I mean one, and now the second one, are somewhat joining the bus stop. They're pausing, they're doing something, but actually one of them is leaving. So it's not like all the uh, sushi stops uh, at a certain bus stop. One seems to have an affinity to the synapse versus the other one leaves it, indicating that there is a certain relationship. In this case, uh, Carl teamed up with Inma, a postdoc, and uh, Volker Scheuss uh, here in the department in the BMC, and we now tried to locally stimulate uh, by glutamate uncaging. And in this case, you see a red point, a red dot. So this particular synapse, and this would be a dendritic spine, is activated by a puff of glutamate. And now we are asking the question on top in green, would we see that a synapse actually would physically enter the um, spine head of the synapse? And you see there is two transient particles of RNA that actually enter physically uh, the postsynaptic side of the, of the synapse, indicating that there is really a close relationship to the bus stop and such an RNA would enter. And then of, obviously the hypothesis would be that uh, the RNA is then locally translated. So you may have heard, um, we call this type um, of the particle a transport RNA granule or a transport RNP. But for sure you have heard that there is a whole variety of different types of RNA granules. What are they? In addition to the central part of a transport uh, RNP with, for example, a Staufen um, or an FMRP or a ZPP, that there is a second particle that uh, you have heard and in this case would be a P or a processing body. And the idea here is that this is uh, particularly uh, forming if uh, there is translational silencing. Uh, so in this respect, the RNA uh, is recruited into these bodies. There is no access to ribosomes and translation is uh, temporarily paused. For sure, you have heard that there's a second particle called the stress granules. They are particularly uh, interested in the moment uh, simply because phase transition uh, and uh, um, the whole idea of uh, um, RNA aggregates in this respect. So they are formed by cellular stress and uh, there are certain markers and certain famous RNA binding proteins called FAS or TDP43 um, that are uh, found in those granules. And uh, for you to know, there is a third one that is maybe less popular these days, but in my opinion, equally important, called the risk complex. Um, a famous marker are the argonaut proteins, in this case, argo2. And in this respect, there is not just a messenger RNA uh, depicted in, but also a microRNA. A microRNA bound to argo, and here would be uh, that there is also translation regulation occurring uh, through the small RNA pathway. So next, um, the idea is we call this the RNA signature hypothesis. So who is in charge? Is it primarily the RNA recruiting the RBPs or is the RBP, the RNA binding protein, uh, the important uh, factor? And in the center, you find an RNA. In the middle, the coding region. On the right side, it's the three prime untranslated regions with many RNA signals. And uh, um, on the left side, there is the five prime untranslated region. You see different signals. I depicted at least one of them for you. So in this case, this secondary structure here is being recognized, for example, by Staufen II, the brain-specific RNA binding protein recognizing large secondary structure. And in this case, this would cause 
uh, the RNA localization which we have shown. You see another signal called the TLC for translational regulation and here we identified another very important RNA binding protein called Pomilio and uh, Pomilio is a translational regulator uh, that um, is regulating that the RNA um, is kept in a repressed state and um, only about that the RNA is released from the granules is being translated. And uh, for Carl's uh, future work, there is a third RNA binding protein. It's a large uh, class of uh, dead box RNA helicases or called DDX or RCK. And uh, here I would like to share a few slides. But overall, you see that those RNA binding proteins can bind to either certain primary signals like Pomilio, to a secondary structure like Staufen, and then they influence either primarily RNA localization or translation control, or in this respect, local protein synapses um, in a dendritic spine at synapses upon synaptic activity. So here, um, I would like to show you uh, some unpublished work uh, from uh, Carl and uh, um, young student Niklas um, here that we used this RNA helicase called DDX6 or RCK. And this is a Staufen interacting protein. And here, Carl and Niklas did a really cool experiment that I would like to share with you. So in one case, we expressed um, the uh, DDX6 uh, coupled with GFD. And those reporters are clearly found again in RNA granules and giving the typical RNA granule look that you see on the next slide. But the nice idea by uh, Niklas and uh, Karl was now what happens if we fuse it with an RNase. So an enzyme that would degrade an RNA preferentially in those particles. And at least here is the idea. So there would be a, a transient disassembly of those particles and would we see because the RNA is less or um, the RNA is no longer in those granules that we see a disassembly process. And here I would like to share one slide uh, from uh, Niklas and from Karl with you. On the left side you see the uh, typical uh, RNA granules with Staufen 2 and DDX6. And uh, you see the appearance in the inset. However, if we now target the RNAs together with the DDX6, it's not like that the uh, particles completely disappear, but you see a significant reduction both in the number as well as in the size of the RNA granules, indicating that it's the RNA that drives the physiological granule assembly. So this argument, these experiments would argue that it's the RNA that is in the driver's seat and is important for the uh, assembly of those particles. So next, I would like to show you one very important slide for you to know that uh, Carl has done quite a while ago. You heard that these so-called RNA condensates um, are very popular these days and uh, there's uh, lots of consequences. If you, and this is an important experiment that I would like you all to make aware of. You take an RNA and you overexpress it in a primary hippocampal neuron. And what you see is with the MS2 system, on the left side, there is a modestly overexpressing uh, cell that you see these typical RNA dots. In the middle and on the right side, there is uh, now a cell that uh, has larger amount of RNA. And this is really important because if you have too much RNA, the RNA immediately tends to aggregate. It looks like as if these would be RNA granules, but they are significantly larger, they are unphysiological, they are aggregates, and there is, uh, um, these uh, lead actually to that the cells are dying and eventually uh, these are dead cells and these are really unphysiological aggregates. So be really careful with this amount. So next I would like to ask you an, one single question. And this is a collaboration with Yanni Ule from uh, the Crick and uh, Yuichiro 
uh, Sugimoto. And so here we have the Human Frontier Grant asking the question, can we do systems biology with a technology called high clip? And in this respect, we UV crosslink this brain-specific Stauten tool to this RNA secondary structure. And then we perform an experiment with RNA sec. And you see data here. This is done by my postdoc Sandra. And we asked the question, um, how many binding sites would we now identify that Stauffen shows? And in this respect, you don't see the entire RNA, but you, uh, we focus here on the three prime untranslated region. And in the red box, you see that it's not like Stauffen binds all over the structure in the three prime untranslated region, but in the middle of the box, you see that there's one particular structure that Stauffen identifies. However, it is a, large, a significantly larger uh, RNA duplex than uh, considered. And on the right side, we now uh, uh, made a mutation so that we just delete 20 nucleotides out of the structure so that this hairpin that is shown in the cartoon on top is no longer binding. And here we take again advantage of the MS2 system and ask the question, a wild type RNA, does it form granules and are they delivered to dendrites? And now if this uh, RNA structure is present or if we delete it, what happens to the RNA localization to dendrites? And if Sandra did the experiment together with Carl, uh, then we found an interesting data set. So the first is a control. So it's not like that there's no RNA in a dendrite, but occasionally you see two dots in a dendrite. The second and the third one is a famous RNA that we identified called RGS4. And this contains this particular structure that we identify. And you see that there are significant numbers of RNA granules formed. And now I would like to bring your attention to the last panel. And in this respect, it's the same RNA, but we just delete one arm of the hairpin so this RNA secondary structure cannot form. And you see both in the graph, um, fourth row on the left, or on the fourth panel on the right side, that a significantly lower amount of RNA granules form, like in the control levels, indicating that we can really disrupt, again showing that it's the RNA and one particular RNA secondary structure that recruits um, the Staufen II. So in this respect, um, I hope that I could convince you um, here in my talk that on one side, um, we uh, see that RNA is being delivered um, into dendrites so that certain RNAs are particularly recruiting RPPs, in this case, Daufen II. We can now interfere with the RNA binding and the delivery. And in this respect, we are now actively working on trying to uh, use another technique called the sun tag uh, that we show at a synapse, at an activated synapse, whether we can show active translation uh, to go on. In this respect, um, this is the talk. I mentioned the people did the experiment. Here are the funders. The collaborators are also uh, largely uh, mentioned uh, in this respect. And I thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Keebler. Um, we're going to move on to our next speaker for this webinar. Dr. Zhang is an associate professor in the Department of Systems Biology, uh, the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics, and the Motor Neuron Center at Columbia University. His laboratory uses an integrative approach to study neuronal RNA binding proteins and how they regulate transcriptomic diversity in the nervous system through alternative splicing in both normal and disease contexts. A current focus of his work is to elucidate the mechanisms underlying the precise control of transcript isoform switches during neural development and across specific neuronal cell types and their functional consequences. So thank you so much for being on the line today, Dr. Zhang. Uh, thank you, Sean, for the invitation and uh, nice introduction. I hope you can hear me well. So. Um, I'm an a engineer converted biologist, uh, so during the conversion, I was actually uh, really triggered by the fact that uh, 
I mean, the nervous system of different organisms are very different in terms of the number of neurons and the number of connections between neurons, for example, in comparison with our brain and the nervous system, the elegance. And this difference clearly is critical for the function of our brain, our computation power, and the, the way, the ability to perform high level function. Uh, on the other hand, that we have very similar number of protein coding genes. So the question is, what is the origin of this complexity? So my left uh, uh, <coughs> approach this question from the angle of uh, alternative splicing. So this is a molecular uh, mechanism to produce uh, different uh, transcript ice forms and a uh, protein ice form by uh, multiple combinations of exons. So this uh, really uh, gives us the opportunity to have combinatorial complexity and amplifier of the genomic information encoded in the genome. So in particular, my lab is very interested in the molecular mechanism that controls the level of exon inclusion depending on cellular contact. So here in a zooming view, you can see the basic mechanism of splicing regulation. So exons have the three prime and the five prime splice sites that serves as the boundaries of the exon. And these are recognized by the splicing machinery called spliceosome. But the important point here is that in addition to a spliceosome, you really need uh, many additional regulatory sequences. They are either in the exon or in the intron. So these regulatory sequences need to be recognized by hundreds of additional RNA binding proteins to either facilitate or block the recruitment of the splicing machinery and the control exon inclusion in specific cell types like in the neuron. So why particularly the neural system? So early on, so this is actually one of the first large scale uh, genomic data sets that allows us to measure gene expression and splicing at the same time. Actually, this is not RNA sequencing. This was the exon junction microarray so this data set measures gene expression and splicing in uh, about 50 human tissues in a cell line. On the left, in the heat map, shows gene expression of RNA binding protein, cell RNA binding protein, red means high expression, low, blue means low expression. On the right is a heat map of several thousand alternative exons, cassette exons. Here, red means high exon inclusion, blue means low inclusion. So you can see that the brain, like different brain regions, really have very distinct gene expression and uh, splicing patterns. So in the zooming view in the middle, you, uh, we highlighted uh, multiple uh, RNA binding proteins, which is specifically expressed in the brain. Actually, multiple, many of them, they are specifically uh, expressed in the neurons. So these are highlighted in blue, and these become the focus of a different project in my lab. So the question that we try to ask is how these RNA binding proteins regulate specific sets of exons specifically in the nervous system, uh, in neurons and other cell types. So we started this uh, about 10 years ago. Why 10 years ago is really this is enabled by the breakthrough in technology by uh, deep sequencing. So now on the top, we can measure splicing by RNA-seq, so this is actually the work I started when I was a postdoc uh, with Bob Donnell at Rockefeller University. So this is a first effort to try to focus on a neuron-specific RNA binding protein NOVA. So on the first two tracks shows RNA sequencing data of wild-type mouse brain and also in the mouse brain with depletion of NOVA. Uh, so this is a green and a red respectively. So you can see that constitutive exons have similar patterns in the wild-type and the a mutant brain, but highlighted are two alternative exons by the arches at the top. So you can see that these two exons show changes. So let's focus on the alternative exon on the right, and you can see this exon is highly included in the wild type mouse brain, and you can see a huge peak similar to the flanking exon, but this peak is gone, meaning the exon is almost completely skipped when you deplete NOVA in the mouse brain. So immediately you see that inclusion of the exon depends on NOVA, but you don't know whether this is direct or indirect regulation. 
So this here, you see that you need to another type of information uh, that measures protein RNA direct interaction. So this is done by CLIP. You already heard of that. This is essentially an RNA version of ChIP-seq that measures protein RNA interaction on a genome-wide scale. So here, the peak tell you where the protein binds. And uh, with this kind of data, we can even train uh, a machine learning model to predict where the protein binds based on the sequence motifs. We know NOVA bind to YCA elements, and they actually require cluster of these to be functional, have a sufficient binding affinity. So at the end of the day, we can combine all these type of information, try to predict which exons are activated or repressed by specific RNA binding protein like NOVA. And we can achieve really high accuracy and sensitivity at the same time because we try to combine all the information we have from the different aspects. So this is how we get started to define the target networks know of proteins. And we think this is a powerful approach. And we continue and extended the strategy to uh, different other uh, neuron and brain-specific RNA binding protein, including uh, IB box, which is mutated in autism and epilepsy, and the muscle blind, which is uh, really critical for myotonic dystrophy with uh, important CNS component, and also other uh, RNA binding protein important for neuron-specific splicing. So what we hope is that after we identify the target networks regulated by each individual RNA binding protein, we can further integrate them, integrate them to have a holistic view how each exon is regulated by multiple RNA binding protein in combination. So this is more real realistic when you consider physiological conditions. So the next question we asked when uh, I started at Columbia University is, how we can take advantage of this regulatory network to understand, for example, the dynamic splicing regulation uh, during a uh, neural development. The reason we think about this is because uh, we think that the neural specific splicing program uh, is really need to be established during this experimental process. So we get this uh, started actually with a relatively straightforward approach. So the project was led by former graduate students Sebastian Wing. So we collected um, the mouse cortex at different time points from E14.5 all the way to the adult and over animals. We performed deep RNA sequencing to quantify splicing. And we clustered the exon based on the similar similarity of the splicing profile during development. Here, a critical emphasis is precisely when these exons show the developmental switch. So here we basically identify three groups of exons um, with the uh, splicing switch at different time points. So let's first focus on the first group at the top. These exons show relatively late switch that occur between P4 and P15. They can either go up or go down. And then the second group in the middle is early switch exons. The switch occurred at one burst or slightly earlier. So we really interested in understanding how this dynamic switch is regulated by the RNA binding protein. So here we took advantage of the splicing regulatory networks of the RNA binding proteins we already defined. A part of the reason also these RNA binding proteins show dynamic expression change uh, during development. So let's first focus on muscle blind, which is on the right. And you can really see it's very strikingly for the late switch exon, about 50% of them are regulated by muscle blind. Also important is the direction. So the exons with a red bar means that the exon is activated by muscle blind. Those exons always show increase during development. On the other hand, the exon is a repressed muscle blind, the exon should decrease. This makes a lot of sense because muscle blind expression uh, go up and between P4 and the P15, this is where spice and switch occur and stabilize after P30. So this really suggests that muscle blind is really critical for the late switch to promote a mature splicing pattern. So now move, let's move on to the early switch and you see the difference. And much fewer exons there are regulated muscle blind by muscle blind, suggesting that muscle blind is 
specifically important for late splicing switch. So how about the other ion binding protein, IB Fox? You see a similar pattern. IB Fox basically facilitates the mature splicing pattern, but this here, it seems to be important for both early and the late splicing switch. So this is summarized here. I'm not going to get into too much detail, but tell you that we also identify additional regulators, including NOVA I mentioned uh, early on, important for early splicing switch, again, promotes mature splicing pattern. Another ion binding protein called PDDP is to repress mature spine pattern. So here actually the result is consistent from funding uh, from the black lab at UCLA. So this seems to be really a powerful approach to understand what's going on during physiological processes during your development. And more recently we extended this approach to try to start understanding the regulation of different types of neurons. So for this we took advantage of the data, the single cell RNA sequencing data generated by Allen Brain uh, Institute. So this is a great resource because they use a protocol called SMASIC that has the whole transcript coverage so that we can use the data to analyze alternative splicing. So the original work, they uh, basically cluster single cells by the gene expression patterns you on the left in, uh, with the Tiffany plot, and you can clearly see the two broad categories of neurons, the glomatergic neuron in blue and a GABAergic neuron in red, they cluster, uh, they form distinct clusters. Not only that, the gene expression pattern can also be used to distinguish different subclasses of neurons under each category. So how about splicing? Can we use splicing pattern to determine the cell types? and also like the neuronal classes and the subclasses? The answer is yes. So this is shown on the Tiffany plot on the right. So this is based on the splicing, not gene expression. You can see clearly the two bull category of neurons, rheumatologic and gabriologic neurons, they form distinct clusters, and also the subclasses, also uh, they tend to cluster together. Suggesting so splicing carries important information of neural identity, and hopefully they also contribute to the neuronal uh, function of different type of neurons. So we get very interested to see whether we can understand better about regulation of the splicing profile of different type of neurons. So we started from the comparison of GABAergic neuron and a glomatergic neuron. So this is shown in the middle. And then particularly what I show here is a target regulated by muscle blind because muscle blind is preferentially expressed in the glomatergic neuron. So again, here you see the very striking pattern how these exons are regulated to muscle blind and how they uh, uh, are different between the two broad category neurons. Basically, if the exon is activated by muscle blind, these exons show higher inclusion in glomatergic neurons. If the exon is repressed by muscle blind, so these are at the bottom, uh, indicated by the blue, these exons show more skipping in the glomatergic neuron. Again, this is high, completely consistent with the higher expression of muscle blind in the glomatergic neuron. So both activation and suppression is more potent. So more activation leads to higher exon inclusion, more uh, repression leads to higher skipping in the glomatergic neuron, suggesting the causative role of this protein to generate the distinct splicing pattern. This is not only ionic binding protein that is important for the neuron-specific splicing pattern. We identified additional ionic binding protein with the neuron-specific expression. They contribute to the distinct splicing program in a different type of cell. So, the, so I think that this kind of provided a great demonstration that being able to use this kind of splice and regulatory network can help to understand molecular underpinnings of the different cell types. So how can we use this information to uh, know more about the physiological function? What's the functional impact of this regulation? So the last part is a brief story. We try to focus on the family of ionic binding protein IB Fox, and, and for this, and uh, we actually uh, take advantage of uh, in vitro system 
So this is a collaboration with Hinek Wichter lab. So Martin Yasko was a former student, joint student between the two labs who uh, led this project. So here, basically what we did, we tried to differentiate uh, in a stem cell into a particular type of neuron, spinal motor neuron. We also took advantage of CRISPR genome editing so that we can deplete all three genes, including the IB Fox protein. So, so obviously this is very difficult to do in mice, but this is important because the three genes are functionally redundant. So we want to compare the wild type and the mutant motor neurons after the in vitro differentiation, and we actually did not see any defect during the early differentiation process, which was a bit um, disappointed for the graduate student. But actually, if you think about it, not too surprising because these ion binding proteins are largely post mitotic. So we think that these IB Fox uh, proteins are mainly important during the later maturation process. So we further mature these neurons and so that we can compare wild type and IB Fox triple uh, knockout. So then the students really see striking difference between the wild type and the triple knockout neuron, basically by patch clamp. Uh, we found that the chipanoka neuron has much reduced firing uh, uh, rate compared to the wild type control. So this is actually the characteristic of less mature neurons, and we have other characterizations of the electrophysiology. I'm not getting into detail, and also this uh, less functional, uh, less mature functional properties is also consistent with our observations that the transcriptome also revert back to the less mature uh, pattern. So the next question is, uh, what is the cellular defects that uh, led to this functional defect? So some students focus on a particular uh, region of the neuron called exon initial segment, or AIS. So this is basically in the proximal part of the exon. So this is a green, staining in green, uh, highlight in this box. So this staining is for the master regulator of the structure called anchoring G. The reason AIS is important because this is where the ion channel, the cluster, so this is really critical for the action potential initiation and propagation. So when we compare the wild type and the mutant uh, motor neuron, you can see the wild type, we have really nice anchoring staining in green. But in the mutant neuron, sometimes they still have normal looking AIS, but a lot of times, you have dramatically reduced AI, the anchoring staining, sometimes completely gone. So this is consistent with the reduced firing frequency in this triple knock-on neuron. And we would like to understand better, dig deeper. And so the next question is, what is exactly the splicing change that leads to the cellular defects? So that's the part that took us uh, really, I mean, most of the time, a lot of time to figure out. And we look at all the components, including AIS structure. And strikingly, we found about half of the genes encoding the AIS component, they have at least one alternative exon regulated by the IB box protein. So after a long, uh, really uh, a lot of uh, study and literature search, we decided to eventually focus on an alternative exon in the anchoring G itself. So anchoring G is the, uh, as I said, the master regulator of AIS, and this is the adapter protein that connect the ion channels and a hidden molecule to the cytoskeleton. So the alternative exon is right located in the protein, uh, next to the protein domain that anchors anchoring G to the cytoskeleton. So this exon is specifically included in the embryonic neuron shown on the right but skip in the adult neuron. So what we have, what happens, we think, is that the peptide encoded by this environmentally regular exon will, uh, is located at the interface of the anchoring G um, with the spectrum, which is the acting uh, skeleton component, and inclusion of this exon will block such interaction. So in the young neuron, you don't have structure. You don't want to have this kind of high affinity interaction, so this exon is included. But as neuron mature, the exon is skipped. That allows the anchoring G to have high affinity interaction with the, the, the cytoskeleton. That will eventually allow the accumulation 
of NG in the region that eventually become AIS. So I will skip a lot of experimental data, but shows you one uh, single experiment to uh, validate this uh, uh, model. Here again, we take advantage of CRISPR to remove this exon in the endogenous locus, but we reinsert this exon right next to the downstream exon. So basically, we fuse the two exons together to force inclusion of this exon during uh, neural development, uh, neural maturation. So effectively, we basically enforce the expression of the embryonic high form in the mature neuron. So that allows us to compare the phenotype between the wild type and the insertion mutants. And you can see that again, in the wild type, we see nice and clean staining, but in the mutants, the staining is much reduced or sometimes completely gone. So this largely recapitulates the phenotype we observe in the RB box to knockout and suggesting the critical importance of single exons during your development for the neuronal maturation and physiological function. So this is basically all the data I like to show. So this is a really the brief summary. I actually did not get into too much detail about our work on the more mechanistic side, trying to take advantage of our ability to map protein ion interaction at single nuclear resolution. That certainly provided us the power to better understand the specificity of our antibody protein and predict which kind of regulatory sequences are important. But I, I, I would say that we made a lot of progress in the past decade, but still, still we have quite a lot to do. On the functional side, which is the focus of this talk, I, was, I, I would say that, I mean, personally, I'm really convinced that RNA regulation is critical for neurodevelopment. We know very little. I mean, I give one example. There are anecdotal examples, other examples in the literature, but we know really little. But if you think about it, think about it, for example, from the evolutionary perspective, these alternative exons are hugely, hugely conserved in the different mammalian species, not only in the coding region, but also in the flanking tronic sequences where the regulatory information is uh, uh, located. And if you think about it, why those sequences have to be conserved during millions of years of evolution. They must be important. We just don't know in which cellular context they are important. So hopefully we will continue the work in this line. In the year to come, we will get more information. So i like to end up uh, here. And I already mentioned people contribute to the project. And collaborators, I mentioned Hinnick Wister, which is really our long-term collaborator uh, about work in the most neuron. And then Demian Williams and uh, contribute to electrophysiology. And of course, she contribute to storm imaging. I did not get into detail. And the Vila man on single cell rna seq analysis. So I like to also have uh, advertisement. We have multiple uh, position for postdoc and students. Uh, whether uh, it's a wet lab or dry lab or anywhere in between. I'd like to stop here. Thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Zhang uh, and Dr. Keebler for the wonderful presentations. We are now going to move along to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, just click the Ask a Question tab to the right and type your question into the message box and then click Submit. Uh, so, Dr. Zhang, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, you show that splicing patterns can be used to identify and cluster different cell types um, in a, a very nice image and comparison. Um, how does this identification and clustering of cell types compare to the identifi identification and clustering that one sees based on general RNA-seq analysis? Uh, and do you see the same overlapping um, the same or overlapping cell types, and does the splicing uh, pattern clustering identify any new or novel cell types? So, sorry, there's quite a few questions in there, but uh, maybe we yeah, can so, we can start with the first. Yeah, so this is actually a really, really great question. So, in general, we get consistent result at kind of higher level clustering. And you know that the neuronal cell types have a hierarchical architecture in terms of the taxonomy. So like the, you have two broad categories, uh, chromatogic and garbage neuron, and each category of several uh, major subclasses. 
at, at this level, as a result, it's a relatively, uh, it's a quite consistent. But when you go down hierarchy, I mean, uh, right now we see um, uh, one major observation is that we see less resolution. So this could be either biology or be, uh, I mean, uh, the technical issues because I mean, when you look at splicing individual exon, in general, you you require higher sequencing depth. At this point, like the sequencing depth we had already uh, is still kind of bottleneck to be able to precisely quantify splicing for many of the exons. So we have a little bit of, of you know, the, the, the signal to noise ratio here. And, and we uh, so relate to your question whether we identify novel uh, cell types. We, we have just a really intriguing uh, observation. So basically what we found is that, we, that if you go down hierarchy of the, um, of the, the neuronal cell types, when like the cell types are defined by uh, like the finer, more of uh, 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 finer resolution, we sometimes like the, the G expression uh, variation does not explain the, like the, the, the subtype of neuron. What I mean is that you cannot find like the, the oh, this ion binding protein is higher in this branch compared to the other branch in the, the, the cell type taxonomy tree. They just like vary among different uh, uh, cell types. But we know that this variation definitely is not noise, it's the biology because the variation expression can explain the variation of splicing of their targets. So that means that we think that there are orthogonal properties that are defined by splicing that is not reflected at the uh, gene expression level in the same way. And uh, the property we can think of is, for example, the range of neuronal projections, the electrical properties to neurons, and but we think that there's really a lot more we can do and we should do. Hey, fantastic. Thanks, Dr. Zhang. Um, Dr. Keebler, coming to you for a question. Uh, do the RNA transport granules contain ribosomes? Uh, what do you think triggers localized translation of the RNAs once they are transported to the synapse? And what are the proteins regulating the decision to translate the RNA? So this is a really important question, and I would like to point out that there are different views. So, if you uh, look for the smaller granules that I showed to you, all the evidence points towards the smaller transit dynamic ones do not contain ribosomes. However, I showed you these larger aggregates, and if you try to isolate thus these larger structures, uh, they contain uh, ribosomes and so on. But my feeling is that they are not transporting RNA and they are not active units. So um, the uh, uh, verdict is still out. In my opinion, the whole idea is that you transport the RNA, and while it's being transported, it would not make sense to actually translate. You then deposit the RNA, you free the RBP, and uh, while the RNA is then uh, kind of deposited to the synapse, then it can be locally translated. But this model has to be proven, but once more, there are different thoughts about it. Great, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Keebler, let me stay with you for another question. Um, when RNP granules change their direction of movement, do they switch motors, and how is the change in direction regulated? So, um, this is a very interesting and it's a very good question. Um, you should know that the complexity um, in dendrites is very high because there's two kinds of the cytoskeleton. In axons, the, it's usually microtubule based and there's uh, uh, microtubules with the plus ends out. So in this respect, most of the so-called axonal transport would be kinesin mediated. The same orientation occurs also in dendrites, but in addition, there are microtubules, shorter microtubules that are with the minus end out. So this means uh, you would have two choices, either that both a kinesin and a dynein would be uh, using transport, but um, to the second part of the question, there's also minus end directed kinesin. And uh, in this respect, uh, so there's two possibilities. The evidence points to that both uh, 
kinesins and dynins are uh, uh, involved, but nobody has yet shown that exclusively one direction is only dependent on dynein and the other one is kinesin. And what the turn in this respect is, um, I think it's the polarity of the microtubules and that uh, you go forth and back because you do not anchor those particles. But on a molecular term, this is still um, early to say, and this is as much as I would know. Great. Uh, Dr. Zhang, uh, let me come back to you. Uh, as, as alternative splicing in disease states is mapped, uh, do you envision more effort in trying to develop inhibitors to key um, RNA binding proteins and splicing factors? Uh, certainly. I think that, I mean, this is uh, really uh, actively explored in the context of both like the, the oncology and also uh, neurodegenerative uh, disease. And uh, there are cases like the RNA binding proteins, if you target these RNA binding protein together with like, for example, tumor immunity, you can have a kind of stronger effect. I would expect that, yeah, so if Especially if the like the um, the RNA binding protein represents kind of upstream um, um, regulators or modulators of the disease or cause of disease, that can be um, I mean a really a great therapeutic uh, target if you have a way. And sometimes like if you have a specific target axon that are critical for the disease, or or can you can uh, take advantage to modulate the gene expression important for disease. That's an alternative way to leverage our knowledge about RNA splicing for therapeutics, for example, using antisense oligo. Great. Thanks, Dr. Zhang. Um, Dr. Keebler, um, let me come to you with this question. I, th I believe it's, it might be related to the previous one. Um, so there's, there's been a number of questions on uh, RNA binding protein specificity. So this particular viewer asks, um, how specifically do RNA binding proteins target mRNA uh, or target RNA? Uh, one Is it one RBP binds one uh, mRNA at a specific site, uh, several sites on one R, uh, mRNA, or does it bind several different mRNAs? So again, this is a very important question. And uh, um, as a first approximation, the overall cartoon was important. Certain RBPs primarily recognize certain primary sequences. So in this respect, there's specificity. Second, like Staufen, they're double-stranded RNA binding protein. Some of them recognize RNA structure. So now to the uh, point in terms of uh, how many uh, um, RNA binding proteins in RNA form an, uh, a particle, we have measured this together with several uh, uh, other laboratories, and the surprise is that um, there are few, not single RNAs, but few RNAs. There can be, for example, uh, um, uh, dimers or it's a uh, hetero-oligomer, but it's not like that it's dozens or hundreds of RBPs and it's not hundreds and dozens um, of either the same copy of the RNA or different RNAs. So certain limited amount of RNAs are bound by a limited set of, let's say, half a dozen of RBPs, and they together form uh, the specificity. That's, in the moment, my working model. Great. So we um, are just uh, um, at the top of the hour, and so I'm, I'm just going to squeeze in one more question. And uh, actually, uh, Dr. Keebler, this one is for you as well. Um, You've been studying how many RNA molecules are present in uh, RMP granules. Uh, is there any update on this work? And also, is it known whether RNA share the same RNA binding protein uh, binding motifs um, if they are present in the same granules? So um, I was already referring to this part in my previous uh, question. So clearly, uh, a, a certain signal in the RNA can be recognized uh, by more than one RBP. In this respect, there may be several primary sequences recruiting distinct RBPs, and on top of that, there may be a third or another uh, RBP recognizing the structure. On the opposite, uh, you can say that, uh, for example, if there is a shared RNA motif, uh, 
uh, that uh, in this respect this can exist then in more than one type of an RNA. So you have classes of RNAs with the same signal. So in this respect it will be interesting that there will be an RNA code and an RBP code and it's more like um, that you combine different types of sushi. So if you have let's say the shrimp or the salmon or uh, certain different uh, types that may share the rice but there's different fish, so you can put the composition of the sushi together by mixing different RBPs and different RNAs. And this is a molecular code, but um, we have not yet fully understood this code. Excellent. Well, uh, we're unfortunately going to have to stop there. Um, so I wanted to thank today's speakers once again. Dr. Michael Kiebler from Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich uh, and Dr. Charlin Zhang from Columbia University. Uh, please go to the URL in the resources tab to find more information related to today's discussion and look out for more webinars from Science available at science.org slash webinars. This webinar will be made available to view again as an on-demand presentation within approximately 48 hours from now. Uh, we're interested to know what you thought of today's webinar. Please uh, send us an email at the address now up in your slide viewer webinar at aaas.org. Again, thank you so much to our panel and to Cell Signaling Technology for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye, everyone.